The United States is a huge country covering almost 4 million square miles. While a lot of our land is de densely populated, we have some beautifully wild areas with landscapes that are as diverse as you could possibly imagine. I'm your host, Leah. And I'm Phil. And I'm Steve. In order to preserve some of these natural wonders, they have been designated as national parks. In today's episode, we'll talk about some of the more bizarre aspects of our national parks. If you have an appetite for the strange and bizarre, then pull up a chair and grab a spoon for another intriguing serving of Remnant Stew. Remnant Stew is gluten-free, organic, made from all natural free-range ingredients and guaranteed to provide the recommended daily serving of curiosity. Now, in the United States, there's deserts, mountains, and lush forests with climates ranging from tropical to arctic. In the 1800s, as the population had expanded from the East Coast all the way to the West Coast, the U.S. government realized the need to conserve some of our magnificent scenery and the natural and historical objects, as well as native wildlife, yeah. so that future generations could experience and enjoy them. That was some good thinking back then. Mm -hmm. And in 1872, Congress passed an act to establish the 2.2 million acres of land in the territories of Montana and Wyoming known as Yellowstone, right. and that was the first national park. That was the first one in the world, in fact, I That's believe. right. Yeah. It began a worldwide national park movement, actually, and today more than 100 nations containing some 1,200 national parks. Today we're going to discuss some of the national parks just in America. Right. While researching this, I became painfully aware of how <laughs> untraveled I am. <laughs> Well, I've been I've been to a lot of state parks. I love going to state yeah. parks, right? Uh, nice in too. both Kentucky and Texas, but I've only been to two of the national parks. I've been to Hot Springs in Arkansas, and of course Mammoth Cave in right. Kentucky. And at the time of this recording, all my boys are in Kentucky visiting family, and they're planning a trip to through Mammoth Cave. Through Mammoth Cave, right. yeah. Right. So nice. So what what about the parks you guys have visited? I have visited. Um, uh, I'm thinking Grand Canyon and the Big Bend here in yep. Texas. And uh, then when I lived in Washington State, the North Cascades and Olympic and Mount Rainier, which we're going to talk about a little bit more later. Um, let's see. Oh, yeah. In uh, Tennessee, I uh, visited the um, Great Smoky Mountains National Park and also the Shiloh National Military Park. We're counting that as a national park because uh, sometimes historic districts also fall into the national park system. Yep. Um, several others, uh, oh yeah, Colorado, yeah, that would be the Rocky Mountains National Park. Yep. And, um, yeah, I think that's, uh, close to 10 of them, I would think. And Black Canyon of the Gunnison, I've been through that one in Colorado. Right. Uh, I'm trying to think of Oh, Sequoia, I've been Sequoia. to Sequoia also, yeah, California. Uh, uh Mount, Redwoods. Mount Rushmore, but, you know, that's in North Dakota. It's kind of cold. Well, yeah, well, or South a, Dakota. Is that I think, a national yeah. park, Dakota, yeah. Yeah. or is that a national monument? Because there, it's there a is national a monument, and then yeah. there's a park and stuff around. Oh, okay, but I think they kind of fall under the national park yeah. system. Maybe you know, national monuments do. I've been through Shenandoah and, and Virginia. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Is there any others? Yeah. Well, yeah, besides the Grand Canyon, that's kind of like one you can't miss when you're going out west. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> well, I love our national parks, and. Uh, you know, they're they're beautiful and they're wild. Now, the wild factor, I believe, kind of tends to catch people off guard. Um, perhaps the word park is misleading even a little bit. Uh, right. You know, city people think of a park as a well-manicured green space with beautiful trees and a duck pond and uh, maybe even a playground for the kitties. That's so cute. <laughs> Our national parks are not like that. Uh, perhaps National Preserve might be a better description right. of them. And the truth is that our national parks are wild, and they can be dangerous if folks are not properly prepared for what they will be encountering. My wife and I stopped uh, by the Grand Canyon National Park uh, 13 years ago when we were on our honeymoon. Uh, it's a little bit odd. If you've been there, you know what I'm talking about. You pull into the parking lot by the visitor center, and then you start walking the trail, and suddenly you find yourself on the edge of the canyon with no fence around it. 
Uh, it's not like uh, the Roadrunner cartoon where Wile E. Coyote <laughs> runs out, finds himself in empty air, and then runs back real quickly. Right. Yeah, no, you get over empty space, it's over. Yeah, gravity takes over. Um, people and animals have actually fallen over the edge. So, folks, you do have to be careful with your and keep a close eye on your kids and your dogs uh, when you come to the national parks. Now, while the U.S. national park system includes 423 national park sites, only 63 of them have the national park designation in the right. names. The other so- sites fall into ca- different categories like national historic sites, national monuments, national seashores, uh, national recreation areas, and others. Even national forests, I think. That's, yeah. yeah, that's right. right. We have no way of considering, uh, of covering even a fraction of these areas. So just know that the parks we talk about are in no way a comprehensive list of the U.S. Right. national parks. Yeah, there's a bunch. Yeah, so. this, yeah, this podcast lasts 23 hours, so as we touch every <laughs> single national park, no. How much time do y'all have? <laughs> <laughs> All right, so let's get started. There might well, be a part 17 and 18 of this show. <laughs> According to a terrific article on fodders.com, F-O-D-O-R-S.com, which is a well-known travel uh, travel guide site, there's no better place to begin talking about national park weirdness, which we know that's what our listeners love, then right here in the great state of Texas. That's right. Well, yeah, if we're going to go weird. This article is home. is written by a talented young journalist named Susie Dundas, D-U-N-D-A-S, and is titled, Why Big Ben is America's Creepiest National Park. <laughs> <laughs> creepiest. Nice. Right. And we are grateful to Ms. Dundas for allowing us to quote directly from her fine article. Thank you. Thank you very much. Big Ben National Park is located in far west Texas. Okay, if you're familiar with the shape of the state of Texas, and why shouldn't you be, (laughs) the far western part of the state comes to a a, a point. The city of El Paso is located at this very western point of Texas. The Rio Grande River flows from uh, Colorado and New Mexico through El Paso, and then it curves to the southeast, and it forms the border between Texas and Mexico. The river, can you tell, I used to be a geography teacher. Well, and let's just take a moment and... and Talk about how big Texas is. Yeah, it's it's when, large. When I go home to Kentucky, I travel through Arkansas, uh, what Tennessee, Tennessee, and then through Ten- Kentucky, yeah. and you are almost halfway uh, right. to Kentucky, to Louisville, Kentucky. When uh, when you get out of Texas, right? Exactly. Well, I I was well, just say this: if you have to travel four hours in any direction. You're still in Texas. Exactly. That's exactly. Well, even uh, I'll give you a better example. Uh, then uh, I was doing some workshops in El Paso about 10 years ago, and I would fly from Houston to El Paso. It's a two-hour flight from That's Houston right. to El Paso. That's right. Know, so, well, Houston uh, to Dallas, three and a half, four hours. Yeah, something like that. Houston yeah, but Austin, driving, yeah. Driving, you know, Houston, Austin, so driving. About three. Yeah. Anyway, back to our topic at hand here. <laughs> so, Wait, um, did we get off again? <laughs> yes. So anyway, the Rio Grande River curves through El Paso and then to the southeast and forms the border between Texas and Mexico. It continues southeast for about 250 miles, then makes a sharp bend to the northeast for about 100 miles. And then it turns again to the southeast and heads another 500 miles to the Gulf of Mexico. The area between, really nearest the first bend and kind of between the two bends, marks the location of Big Bend National Park, hence the Big Bend in the Rio Grande River. (laughs) Okay, when I was a confused kid, I thought that London's famous clock tower, Big Ben, was also located out in (laughs) West Texas. Yeah, Um, well, I could see that. (laughs) It's It's in an isolated area marked by mountains and a high desert. According to Ms. Dundas' article, Big Bend National Park is one of the least visited national parks in the United States, although it is the seventh largest at 1,252 square miles. Okay, that's larger than some states, I think. It sees less than 500,000 visitors per year. Uh, Compare that with the Great Smoky Mountains National Park, which we'll talk about later. That has more than 11 million visitors each year. And we'll kind of talk about why they get so many in a little bit. Population? Yeah, Yeah. nearer to population centers. You can expect, in Big Bend National Park, you can expect trails to yourself and campsites with possibly one other tent in the area. Solitude is the norm, not the exception. That sounds amazing. (laughs) As mentioned above, Big Bend is in an isolated part of Texas. The nearest interstate highway is 177 miles to the north. The nearest major city, El Paso, is over 200 miles away. The nearest hospital is in a pretty little college town called Alpine, Texas, and that's still 110 miles uh, to the north. Most of the park's trails are rugged, and the back roads are unimproved. 
This remoteness contributes to Big Ben's creepiness, but also makes it attractive to many people. The isolation also contributes to his status as a dark sky park. Yes. This Dundas writes, quote, If you're afraid of the dark, you may run in horror at the idea of spending the night under a tent in Big Ben, an official international dark sky park. Or you may love it, as the dark skies and constellations are brighter here than just about anywhere else in the country. Because there's nothing else around. And that's right. <laughs> this darkness is due to the complete lack of light pollution from surrounding towns because there are no surrounding towns. <laughs> An area can be designated as a dark sky park if it is particularly removed from unnatural light and offers exceptionally good viewing of the night sky. And I can vouch for this myself, especially on nights when there's little moonlight. The Milky Way and the Big Dipper and the other constellations look near enough to reach up and touch. Oh. Exceedingly bright, unbelievably beautiful. Okay, ready? Time for the song. The stars at night are big and bright, deep in the heart of Texas. Okay, okay that's enough of that. Well, yeah, these are... good we have our own song. Yeah, so very know. good. There are also Maybe. several creepy abandoned places in Big Ben that you can visit, including a mercury mine. How uh, creepy I'm, would that be? I'm thinking that's not a good place to visit. <laughs> a hot springs bathhouse. And an entire abandoned town, according to Ms. Dundas, camping requires you to step out of your comfort zone. But most people can agree that camping alone in an abandoned town can be rather creepy, which you can do at the Terlinga Abajo campsite. Not to be confused with the other town of Terlinga nearby that's kind of a campy town itself, but uh, the, this one is actually an abandoned town. The campsites here are very basic. No electricity, no facilities, no running water, but lots of cactus, so that's nice. Oh, wow. The abandoned town still has some walls and remains of old buildings, as well as some ancient pieces of farm equipment and other unidentifiable, <laughs> un <laughs> and other unidentifiable <laughs> items scattered around. UFIs. Yeah, that's right. Another creepy factor relates to the poisonous snakes and venomous spiders that reside in the park. Dundas writes, quote, You'll want to keep an eye out for the Mojave rattlesnake, also known as the Mojave Green. It's considered to have the most to have the most dangerous venom of any rattlesnake in the world. Oh, well, wow. yeah, you only yeah. You, you've, it's only going to take you, you know, maybe two hours to get to get the to nearest the, hospital. Exactly. <laughs> and, and just well, to I'll point tell you, out, I'll tell you a little story about that in a minute. Some of our listeners are going, "Nah, -uh, snakes are not poisonous. <laughs> right? They're what? They're, They're venomous. venomous. Yeah. Venomous, right? But, but whatever. Yeah. Well, this snake's venom packs a four-pronged punch as it attacks your brain, nervous system, heart, and blood vessels. If you're going to a nice big, feeling. It's not like a Stephen King movie. <laughs> if you get bit, you need to drop what you're doing and get medical attention immediately. And like I said, remember, the hospital's 110 miles away. <laughs> Worse still is that this snake isn't just found in the park. It's very common. Uh, Dundas notes that they are also prone to defending themselves, which means that they strike more readily than many other species. It's a smart idea to learn how to identify this snake and give it a wide berth if you see it slither across your trail. Now, if snakes aren't bad enough, check out the spiders. <laughs> Big Bend is home to more than 3,600 insect species, and new ones are always being discovered. By far the most dangerous is the black widow spider a species considered more deadly than the park's snakes. According to Dundas, fortunately, it's easy to recognize a black widow because of its ominously bright red hourglass shape on its belly. Have you ever seen a black widow spider in person? Yeah, yeah we have a, You just have here. to see its belly yeah. first. Yeah. Hey, can, hang on a sec. Can you just roll over? Yeah. Okay, good. I'll Get a stick. Over. I had one in my sink the other day. Oh, yeah, they're, they are. They're, but they're not, they're not real uh, aggressive. Yeah. Fortunately. So. Well, I happen to have some personal experience with this. Back in the uh, in the 1970s, my older brother Dick and his wife Donna, they went to college in Alpine, and then they spent their summers working at Big Bend. The park had a, a small living quarters for the workers. One morning, Dick woke up and walked into the bathroom. Suddenly, he felt his foot tingling. Oh, no. He looked down, and a black widow spider was on his foot. He managed to capture the spider in a glass jar, but soon noticed that his second toe on the uh, second to the smallest toe on his right foot was beginning to swell. Oh. Knowing that he'd been bitten, he did his best to stay calm. He got Donna to get a, a friend to drive them the 110 miles wow. to the hospital in Alpine. By the time they arrived, he was pretty sick. Fortunately, the hospital had anti-venom on hand, but it was still four or five days before he could leave the hospital, and he was weak for several days after. It was really a close call. Wow. One final thing that makes some folks uneasy about Big Ben is that it's just across the Rio Grande from Mexico, 
This part of Mexico is quite rural, but for many years, the local population on both sides have casually crossed from one side to the other. There's not an official border crossing here. You just wade across the river, and the river is even pretty shallow these days. Um, there's no wall, of course. Some Mexican residents uh, carve elaborate walking canes and other folk art and bring them across the river for Americans to purchase. In such an isolated location, rules are kind of sparsely enforced. Again, this makes some visitors to Big Ben uneasy, but to others, it's part of the allure of this beautiful region. So, uh, I love Big Ben, but yeah, you, you are cautious when you go there. I bet. I would love to see. I would love to stargaze from there. Now, the stargazing is really um, uh, amazing, and it's not too far from, you may have heard of the McDonald Observatory. I that's have. also in that same part of Texas that has these amazing star-watching parties that uh, are just really, really fun. All right, well, now let's travel to one of the most visited national parks in the United States and certainly one of my favorites, none other than Mount Rainier National Park way up in Washington State. Now, if you've ever looked at a tourist bureau photo of Seattle or the, the picture of Seattle that you normally see anywhere, you've no doubt seen the Space Needle in the foreground and the, the harbor that curves along to the right-hand side uh, and the, also the rest of the sprawling city. But on the horizon behind the downtown skyscrapers, you will notice what looks like a giant scoop of vanilla ice cream sitting atop the distant <laughs> mountains. That scoop is Mount Rainier, some 60 miles away. According to nationalparks.org, Mount Rainier is 14,410 feet tall, and it certainly dominates the surrounding landscape. Mount Rainier National Park was established in 1899 and was the fifth national park in the United States. Nearly two million visitors come through the park's gates each year to engage in camping, hiking, mountain climbing, wildlife gazing, and more. When I was living and working in Seattle, it was one of our favorite places to go. We took numerous family and school trips to Rainier. Uh, even though there are many mountains in the area, Seattleites refer to Rainier simply as the mountain because you've got all these other mountains, and then it's like one and a half times taller yeah. than every other mountain that's in the area. It's like, oh, those are cute hills. <laughs> <laughs> so what makes Mount Rainier creepy? Well, there are several things. First of all, it is an active volcano. Yep. Now, it's not as active as its neighbor to the south, Mount St. Helens, which you remember had an uh, eruption in 19, yes. a major eruption in 1980. And they are, that you can actually see Mount St. Helens from Mount Rainier. They're only uh, maybe 100 miles uh, apart. Um, anyway, they, uh, it, it, Mount St. Helens erupts more frequently. But nevertheless, even though its last major eruption, talking about Mount Rainier, last major eruption was probably about 1,000 years ago, it's still seismically very active. As mentioned earlier, the Seattle-Tacoma metropolitan area with a population of 3.3 million lay just a lava flow away. Um, and uh, the, the highways there actually have extra lanes designated as volcano escape lanes. Uh, you know, like <laughs> here of, we have hurricane yeah, lanes. Yeah, here they we have, have hurricane lanes, yeah. yeah. They have volcano lanes for people to get away from there. And worse yet, the volcano doesn't even have to erupt to create havoc. Uh, Mount Rainier, it's a beautiful mountain. It is so pretty. Uh, it's capped by no less than 25 glaciers on the top of it. Uh, <coughs> in the late summer, these glaciers are clearly defined, but during the winter, the entire mountain is completely covered with ice and snow. Sometimes, though, the mountain heats up from the inside, and when that happens, then the snow and glaciers begin to melt. And if it heats up rapidly, then the snow melt can be rapid as well, causing something called a pyroclastic surge. You ever heard of that term before, a pyroclastic no, surge? Never have. Well, it's you know when the 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 mountain gets warm and all the snow and ice suddenly melts, and uh, it basically causes an avalanche of snow, ice, mud, rocks, and debris that rumble down the the slopes of the mountain at a frightening rate. It can wipe out trees, bridges, and people if they happen to be in the way. Oh wow. Uh, there were many Native Americans up in the Pacific Northwest, and uh, I always enjoy hearing Native American folklore, and they had some folklore about the mountains as well. Native Americans called Mount Rainier Tahoma, or some of them Tacoma. That's where the city of Tacoma gets its name. Uh, and they had many legends about the mountain. According to a website called eatonville to rainiercom Eatonville it happens to be a nearby town, the Cowlitz tribe, C-O-W-L-I-T-Z, is a Native American tribe in the area. And they told a story that Mount Rainier, which they call Tahoma, 
and near another nearby mountain called Mount Adams, which they call Pato, well, they were the two wives of Mount St. Helens, which they called Suk. Well, a big fight broke out between the two wives, Tahoma and Pato, and during the fight, Tahoma stepped on Pato's children and squished them. <laughs> now, Pato, which is Mount Adams, to the south is to the southeast of Mount Rainier, and it rises from a flatter plain, whereas Mount Rainier puffs out of the Cascade, so it looks like she's got her children around her, whereas Pato, all her children were squished. So, <laughs> now it wasn't uncommon for the Native American families to have more than one wife, and so perhaps they were drawing from real practical Frank experience Lord, yeah. about <laughs> about the uh, about the wives fighting with each other. Arguably, the creepiest factor about Mount Rainier is that it is also, in fact, a mass grave. According to an article from the Seattle Post-Intelligencer, which is uh, seattlepi.com, the mountain was the site of a tragic plane crash just after World War II. On December 10, 1946, six United States Marine Corps transport planes took off from San Diego headed for Seattle. After the six planes crossed the Columbia River into Washington State, the skies became extremely cloudy and stormy. The pilots were flying by their instruments only. Because their R-5C transport planes were not pressurized, they were flying at a, about 9,000 feet of altitude. Each plane was carrying around 30 Marines. Four of the planes decided to head back across the Columbia and landed safely in Portland, Oregon. A fifth plane made it through the clouds and landed in Seattle. The six, however, vanished with its last communication transmitted at 4.13 p.m. on that day, December 10, 1946. Thirty-two Marines were on board this missing plane. A major, uh, a major who was a pilot, and a lieutenant colonel who were a pilot, a master sergeant, a sergeant military policeman, and 28 Marine Corps privates. For several days, stormy conditions prevented search, uh, search planes from flying. The weather finally cleared on December the 16th, nearly a week later, but air and ground searches found no side of the plane. After two weeks, the search was suspended as heavy snow had fallen, likely covering any sign of the wreckage. It wasn't until the following August that oh, searchers man. came across the remains of the plane. Navy officials concluded that the plane crashed into the side of Mount Rainier at around the 10,500-foot level at a rate of 180 miles per hour. In other words, there was no slowdown. Or they, were, they were flying along and just hit the, hit the mountain full speed. Goodness. The bodies of 11 men were tangled inside, and an additional 14 bodies were encased in the ice. Recovery crews were certain that the remaining seven were in the wreckage as well, though their bodies were never found. So so they don't think any of them survived the crash? No, most likely not at that speed. No. The conditions around the crash site were extremely hazardous. Crevices had appeared in the ice and uh, more lay hidden beneath thin layers of snow. It took the experienced climbers more than four hours just to traverse a half a mile. Because of the dangerous conditions, officials decided not to recover the bodies of the crash victims so as not to endanger the lives of the recovery crews. During most of the year, the wreckage is covered under ice and snow, but occasionally, late in the summer of years when snowfall is lower than normal, the site can be spotted with binoculars. A memorial at a trailhead in the park honors the 32 Marines who died in the crash. Wow, I didn't know any of that. Interesting. Well, I have a few short stories featuring general National Park weirdness. The first instance of weirdness is that there have been recently been some wooden structures randomly appearing in the woods in Santa Fe National Forest. Oh, yeah. I think I've heard about this. The Santa Fe National Forest is 1.6 million acres of mountains, valleys, and mesas in northern New Mexico. It's one of those parks that's not an official national park, but this weird this news is weird enough that I'm going right. to just slip it in here. It's a beautiful area. Each structure is made up of over a thousand pieces of wood, mostly from fallen trees and branches. Some of the structures are over 20 feet tall. That's six meters tall. Well, that's getting on up there. And 12 feet or four meters in diameter and have left forest officials at a loss. They just, they don't know what is going on or who's doing this. Right. The sticks are arranged like in a, TP shape okay. to create a shelter that you can enter into. And remnants of a campfire have been found in a few of them, mm -hmm. uh, which makes park officials very uneasy. Uh, about 20 of the structures right. have been discovered throughout the park so far. Well, somebody's building them. Somebody's, yeah. building, somebody's building them. them and then well, using actually, them. even using them, yeah. Well, yeah. and here's the thing no one knows who's constructing them. 
Uh, but there's some wild theories. <laughs> yeah, I, bet. <laughs> I bet there is. Sasquatch again, right? Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Mm-hmm. Sasquatch, has, you know, that's always. He's, like, he's handy yeah. with fire, I understand. Yeah, yeah, so. yeah. He's, he's running uh, around. Him and his family. Yes. Yeah, that's right. Family reunion yeah, the kind of thing. <laughs> um, but then also the, the ritualistic structures created by a cult. Of yeah. course. Why go. not? Yeah. In any case, the park rangers are worried that they may pose a fire hazard. So anyone caught building one of them could be fined $5,000 or spend six months in jail. Hmm. So there you go. Wow. Uh, I got my info on that from abqjournal.com, which is Albuquerque, Albuquerque Journal. Nice. Yeah. Interesting. Uh, well, uh, Olympic National Park oh, I've been there is too. Yeah. on Washington's Olympic Peninsula in the mm-hmm. Pacific Northwest. The park sprawls across several different ecosystems, from the dramatic peaks of the Olympic Mountains to old-growth forests. I love that term, old, old growth. growth. Yeah, yes. and there are some like enormous I'm, old trees there. Uh, you know. I want to go oh, so that, badly. Okay, Forks is you know, Forks from the, uh, with the with the Twilight series, you know, the... the Okay, now yeah, I, I do remember the Twilight series. Yeah, the, the, it takes place in Forks, Washington, and that's, that's right. right at the edge of Olympic National Park. So okay. you get that kind of darkness, you know, yeah. feeling there. All of it, yeah. So you yeah. got werewolves and vampires yeah. and stuff fighting it out in there. Um, on January 27th and 2018, at about 1.30 a.m., more than 100 gigantic old-growth trees in Olympic National uh, Park were knocked over. In yeah. an area that stretched for over 1,000 feet. I left a zero off there, no, but okay. it's 1,000 feet. They just fell over. Well, just the fell resulting over. thud was strong enough to show up on a small seismic. as a small earthquake uh, on a seismic monitor. Um, scientists were left scrambling. They don't. They didn't know what caused it. They could not tell. They, they're, the best thing that they could come up with is that a microburst of wind. Mm-hmm. Uh, but they admit that's even unlikely since there's no severe weather anywhere near that region that night. Wow. Uh, others have speculated, of course. Big Bigfoot. Bigfoot yeah. Or aliens. He was scratching his back. Uh, right. Got a twitch. <laughs> you know, just knocked him over. A little mad. But it's still a mystery. No wow. one knows. And I got my information from local newspaper websites, SeattlePI.com. Oh. Aliens. Which, isn't that who you just... Yeah, Seattle, the, yeah. Seattle Post Intelligence. That's, the... that's funny. Both of us yeah. use the same source and didn't know it. And uh, www.cronline.com, which stands for Chronicle. Okay. Now, moving downwards to Hawaii. Hawaii is our tropical island state located outside North America in the South Pacific Ocean. Uh, I haven't been there. I want to go. No, I've never been there either. The state me, is actually... Me neither. Uh, yeah, it's ma- made up of several beautiful volcanic islands, with the biggest one of these named uh, the island Hawaii, uh-huh. and that's where Hawaii Volcanoes National Park is located. The park encompasses the summits of the two of two of the world's most active volcanoes, uh-huh. Kilauea, right. Kilauea, yes, and uh-huh. uh, I'm trying to say it right. Mauna Mon- Loa? Mauna Loa. Yeah. Mauna Loa and Kilauea. Right. The native people of Hawaii have, uh, they have this rich culture steeped in their own unique lore and legend. And I'm hoping that one of these days we can maybe do a podcast on just their yeah, lore right. and legend. Road trip. Oh, wait, no. It'd be a yeah, plane true. trip. Yeah, we need to. Yeah, it would just definitely be a trip. <laughs> <laughs> Boat trip or plane trip. Yeah. Um, Don't row. But an interesting belief among the islanders is the curse of Pele. Pele is the Hawaiian goddess of fire and volcano, and legend has it that she resided in the crater of Kilauea. Uh-huh. How do you say that? Ki- Kilauea. Uh, Kilauea. Kilauea. Yeah. I keep forgetting how to say it. Kilauea. And that volcanic eruptions and lava flows are caused by her wrath or displeasure. Yeah, that makes According sense. According to the legend, Pele uh, considers the lava rocks and sand to be her children and taking one of those, a, a Ooh, rock or a vial yeah. of sand, yeah. incredibly angers her. Tourists have scoffed at the legend and have taken what they wanted. Uh, but of they, course, imagine that. But they've reported to have misfortunes, such as the deaths of pets, oh, the okay. ends of relationships, and even the deaths of loved ones. Well, yeah, because they, they took they got, the rocks. Because they knew that they took the rocks. They so, yeah. knew they took the rocks, had a guilty the conscience, and they then, left. Yeah. yeah. The dogs and animals, I'm not, you know, the animals and pets, I'm not 100% sure. And no one knows for sure how long the curse is supposed to last because those that believe they're afflicted (laughs) quickly mail the stolen items back to Hawaii (laughs) 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 to rid themselves of this curse. I didn't know Kilauea had an address, but okay. Yeah, right. Well, they they send it back to park rangers. Oh, they go, okay. So no one really knows how the curse of Pele got started. Since hey, guys, none... what do we get in the mail? Oh. <laughs> More rocks. <laughs> More rocks. Exactly. <laughs> and, and the park rangers are a little tired of it. I bet yeah. they, they are. are. 
Uh, and, and here's the thing. The curse of Pele doesn't really align with the Hawaiian religion at all. It, it, it kind of popped up out of nowhere. Right. And uh, so no one really knows where the curse of Pele got started because none of it really aligns with the native religion. Right. Skeptics say it was the invention of park rangers. Frustrated oh, with tourists. <laughs> <laughs> they were bored. Yeah. The tourists and their lack of respect. Uh, the park rangers, though, are tired of it since they are the ones having to deal with it. They get it, and they're, they're the ones that have to yeah. replace it. And they get a, Another rock. Take wait, it up to the mountain. Wait, wait. But again, they get it. How do they know where to go put it back? I mean, you do know, they have to well, put the child back in the same spot? It's not or, their know? curse, so <laughs> yeah, they sure. don't no. care. They just <laughs> they put just it back. It. Okay. Um, another origin the theory. Amazon. Is that bus drivers? Because because there's you know there's not a lot of cars. You have to take a bus yeah, everywhere, right? and so that the bus drivers got tired of cleaning up after the rude and self entitled <laughs> tourists, oh, man. and they made up the story. Either way, the moral of the curse is similar to the mantra of any national park ranger, a respectable hiker or camper: leave things the way you found them. In other words, leave no trace. Don't right. take it home with you. Take only pictures, leave only footsteps. I've exactly. Heard that yeah. Maybe sweep those up. <laughs> and now for something completely off topic and off kilter brace yourself for the oddity du jour all right for our oddity du jour today uh, this comes from an article in smithsonian.com one day in the fall of 2020 a police detective in israel named ido hefetz i-d-o-h-e-f-e-t-z was summoned from his office to report to a neighborhood called Moza in the mountains west of Jerusalem. Hetza specializes in examining fingerprints. His careful work at crime scenes has earned him a sterling reputation in Israeli law enforcement. However, when he arrived at the address, he found that he wasn't at a crime scene, but rather at an archaeological dig called the Tel Moza Excavation. Archaeologists at this three-acre site had found numerous artifacts from the Byzantine era, which roughly stretched from the 4th to the 7th century A.D. Workers had uncovered a church, an olive press, a wine press, and a kiln. It was the kiln which caused archaeologists to contact Hefetz. An alcove next to the kiln, uh, kiln contained some 230 fragments of clay lamps, jugs, bowls, and roof tiles, and more than a third of them were covered in very clear, uh, very clearly defined fingerprints that were some 1,500 years old. Cool. The archaeologists were hoping that Hefetz could help them to better understand the person or people whose fingerprints were now visible. Now, I wasn't aware of this, but you can tell a lot about a person by their fingerprints. I mean, you watch these crime shows, but you knew this, so. No, I had no idea. According to the Smithsonian article, the greater the ridge density in a fingerprint, the more likely it belongs to a woman. Huh. Less density indicates the person was male. Also, as individuals grow older, the distance between the ridges and their fingerprints increases. Wait, did he just say men were less dense? Uh, <laughs> I don't know about that. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, oh. I had to go. You're welcome. <laughs> Anyway, experts are generally able to determine the age and gender of a person based on their fingerprints. Okay, this is something I had no That's clue. That's interesting. Yeah, yeah, I've even been to a fingerprint class and, and <laughs> learned how to do the how to lift fingerprints. Right. <laughs> but the article cites another study that was conducted in the southwestern part of the United States in 2019. Researchers studying fingerprints on pottery shards of an ancient Pueblo settlement determined that pottery making in this location was done by both men and women. Similarly, analysts on prints found on an ancient cave painting in Spain indicated that the main artist was likely a 30-year-old man, but was assisted by a 10-year-old girl. Uh -huh. <laughs> uh, okay. The, Israeli, uh, the Israel site uh, proved interesting in that the great majority of the thumbprints were done by the same person, most likely a male. Uh, but he had a couple of assistants as two other prints were detected. Just for fun, Hefetz decided to test the theory that no two fingerprints are alike by running the Mo uh, Moza prints through the database of some 1.3 million Israeli prints. There was no match. <laughs> <laughs> because well, if there would have been, that would have been that's, interesting. That, well, that's why he said, if there were a match, I'd have to look for another job. <laughs> <laughs> or he, it would prove time travel. Yeah. But he <laughs> says, it was interesting to test that assumption. And he also points out that there's nothing new in the print patterns from the Moza prints to those of today. Quote, it wasn't that it was one thing in Bay Byzantine times and then evolved. There was evolutionary preservation. In other words, the same patterns are still there that were there 1,500 years ago. Oh, wow. Yeah. 
Uh, Shulamit Teren, who is the lead archaeologist at the Motzadig, says that cross-collaboration with the police only makes sense. Quote, Detectives and archaeologists share an intense inquisitiveness, a devotion to facts, attention to detail, and a focus on clues found in a specific place. Perhaps we'll see more of this in the future. So I thought that was kind of interesting. That is very interesting. Ancient fingerprints, and you can tell a lot about the people who did, who made them. And we're back. Yay! Dun, dun, dun. As mentioned earlier, Great Smoky Mountains National Park is the most visited park in the United States. Its location on the border between Tennessee and North Carolina make it an easy day's drive from most any point on the East Coast, Midwest, and Southern United States. Some 12 million people a year visit the park. The nearby attractions of Gatlinburg and Dollywood add to the tourist appeal. About 15 years ago, my son and I spent a very pleasant day there. Beautiful place. The Great Smoky Mountains, named thus due to the ever-present morning mist which hangs over its hills and valleys, is America's oldest mountain range. The park was established in 1926 and is comprised of ridge upon ridge of pine and hardwood forest. Mm-hmm. According to the National Parks, uh, I'm sorry, according to NationalParks.org, the park is world-renowned for the diversity of its plant and animal life. The beauty of its ancient mountains, spectacular waterfalls, and its history of Southern Appalachian mountain culture mm-hmm. containing some 80 historic buildings. That's my ancestors right there. There you go. <laughs> so how is it weird? Well, according to a terrific website called Piddlin.com. I love that. P-I-D-D-L-I-N. Piddlin.com. Isn't that what we're doing on this podcast a lot? Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> Because so many people visit the park each year, it's not surprising that some of them get themselves lost. No, really? Yeah, most of these unfortunate folks are located by rescue services within 48 hours of their disappearance. The surprising part is the number of people who aren't found. They simply seem to vanish, leaving no trace that they were even ever there. It's like they fell off the edge of the earth and are never seen again. Smoky Mountains National Park has gained a reputation for its vast amount of strange and unexplained disappearances. One example of this is the case of Dennis Martin. Mm -hmm. Dennis Martin was a six-year-old boy, and he and his family, consisting of four other brothers, were hiking uh, with their father and grandfather through the park on June 14, 1969. It was Father's Day weekend. At one point, the brothers decided to pull a prank on uh, on the adults. Quote, Let's split off the trail and run ahead, then jump out at Dad and Gramps and scare them. Ha ha. So the three brothers went off in one direction, and Dennis and another brother went in another. A couple of minutes later, four of the brothers jumped out of the woods and gave the adults a good scare. However, after a few minutes, they noticed that Dennis was not among them. He was wearing a bright red shirt, so so it shouldn't be too hard to see him, even in the thick woods. The family started searching, but there was no sign of him. After a while, they contacted the Park Service, and an organized search was begun with many volunteers. Eventually, the FBI and the National Guard joined the search, still no sign of Dennis. More than 50 years have now passed, and there's no explanation about what happened to Dennis Martin. Yeah, I'm familiar with that case. I mean, it's just like he was out of sight for, for two minutes at the most. Or less, well, yeah. his other brother two was running minutes. with him, and yeah. he just disappeared on him. Yeah. He had yeah. no idea it happened. He just yeah. absolutely fell off the face of the earth. Uh, you imagine how that brother feels? Yeah. <laughs> and what do you do? Like, like you, you yeah. might have yeah. fallen in a hole. You know, right. How do you go yeah. home? Yeah. Yeah. It's been pretty without, di- difficult. Without, yeah. Oh. Dennis is not the only one. You might think it's one thing for a child to disappear without a trace, but what about an adult? In uh, September of 1981, a 58-year-old woman named Thelma Melton was hiking with two friends on a trail that she was well familiar with. She lived near the park and uh, for for like 20 years hiked the trail quite a bit. She got slightly ahead of her friends, walked around a bend in the trail, and simply vanished. As Thelma was somewhat overweight with high blood pressure, she wasn't what you would call a quick hiker. Still, her friends and then later Park Service authorities uh, searched, and they found absolutely no trace of her. Her disappearance is still okay. unsolved. At least three more cases of unexplained disappearances from Smoky Mountains Park include the 1976 disappearance of 16-year-old Trini Gibson, who disappeared while on a school field trip, the 2008 mystery of 51-year-old Michael Heron, whose truck was found idling on an isolated area with no sign of him, 
and the 2012 disappearance of Derek Luking, whose uh, vehicle was found loaded with camping and survival equipment. All of these Smoky Mountain disappearances remain unsolved to this day. Isn't that crazy? Yeah. Well, here's the thing. Speaking of disappearances in national parks, there are so many instances of people going missing that we could create uh, another podcast dedicated just Mm. to that. A quote from greenmatters.com says, It's unclear exactly how many people go missing in national parks every year. In fact, many believe the number is underreported, though. The reason for that is unknown. Between 1958 and 2021, there were only 29 open cold cases for missing individuals at national parks, according to Trail and Summit. The Grand Canyon and Yosemite make up over half of those missing cases, with the most being banished or having banished from California's Yosemite National Park. But as previously mentioned, many think those numbers are much higher. Some think that more than a thousand people on average go missing from national parks and public lands every year. So there's this conspiracy theory called Missing 411 in which former police officer turned investigator and author David Paulides has written several books on the subject. His project, Missing 411, a series of self-published books and two documentary films, focuses on unsolved cases of people who have gone missing in the United States National Parks. Hmm. So if this is a direct quote. This is reading from missing-411.com, so so David Pollard's uh, website. Right. A national park ranger told David Pollard's a troubling story. Over his years of involvement with numerous search and rescue operations at several different national parks, he had detected a trend that he couldn't understand. The ranger explained that during the first seven to ten days of a disappearance, he would witness massive search and rescue activity and significant press coverage. Following this initial week-long effort, there was almost always an immediate halt to the coverage, a discontinued search for the victims, and no explanation from the search authorities. Hmm. It bothered David enough that he began asking questions, yet he got no answer. So he, he conducted research. Right. What he discovered shocked him. People of all ages have been disappearing from national parks and forests at an alarming rate, all under similar circumstances. Victims' families are left without closure, and the Park Service refuses to follow up or keep any sort of national list and or database of the missing people, thousands of missing people. David's instincts, and I'm still quoting from that website, David's instincts told him that this was a story that needed to be told. He devoted six years to investigating missing people in rural areas. The result? The identification of 52 geographical clusters of missing people in North America. These clusters form the basis for four missing 411 books that have garnered widespread acclaim and multiple five-star ratings on Amazon.com. The story has been featured on several primetime newscasts and on hundreds of radio stations across the country. Now, I and that's the end of the quote. Right. This was the origin for the missing 911 conspiracy theory revolving around people disappearing uh, in national parks. And even though his books are self-published, they're in high demand. I naturally wanted the books. Uh (laughs) But I I couldn't find any of them for less than $150. A a single book? A single book from Amazon. Or less than – or I could find some for uh, around $50, $60, $70 if used copy. That's still a little steep. Yeah, right. Right. So uh, the documentaries are much more readily available, and I haven't I haven't looked at them yet. But um, now I will say though that this David Paulides also wrote several books on Bigfoot, so he's very into the conspiracy right. theory thing. But there is something to it, and I also have seen a map of uh, the United States and the missing, the unsolved the miss- yeah. well, the well, unsolved missing people, okay? Yeah, okay, and and where they are. And then a map of the United States and their cave systems. Huh. And and it it's like really, they might have fallen in caves. Yeah. They, yeah. It, they really. Or the, if it goes under an area where there was a trail, and yeah. But yeah, again, so for it to, cave in goes through, or yeah. at least the cave in a underneath, sinkhole and or a something. sinkhole, and then it fills back up. Mm-hmm. That person's stuck in the dirt. So right. that's one theory. Of course, there's yeah. Bigfoot uh, theories yeah. and alien theories. Yeah. And Sasquatch like just that. picking them up and walk away. Yeah. This next story might not be suitable for children. Uh, We're going to talk about a serial killer. On March 1st of 1980, the nation was stunned when a teenager walked into a Ukiah, California police station and told officers that he had been kidnapped seven years before. 
Oh, he was, wow. Yeah. He was quoted as saying, I know my first name is Stephen. Wow. The 14-year-old teenager turned out to be Stephen Stainer, who had been abducted December 4th, 1972, on his way home from school by convicted child rapist Kenneth Parnell. Hmm. Stephen was just seven years old at the time of the kidnapping. Parnell would change Stephen's name to Dennis Gregory Parnell and for the next seven years would pass him off as his own son. Told that his parents couldn't afford so many children, Stephen was one of five, Mm -hmm. and that they didn't want him anymore, Stephen never tried to escape, even after being enrolled in school. He never tried to escape, that is, until he grew too old for Parnell's tastes and another boy, five-year-old Timmy White, was abducted. It was at this point that Stephen tried to return the boy to his parents to save him from what he had had to endure living with Parnell. But Timmy was too young to remember how to get home, so Stephen ended up taking him to the nearest police station. Mm -hmm. Under questioning, Stephen finally was able to open up about who he really was and eventually told them everything about Kevin Parnell. Now... Kenneth Parnell, yeah. Hear all of y'all asking or thinking, what in the world does that have to do with, with the national, national parks? parks. <laughs> yeah. I'm getting there, I promise. One of the things about missing children that nobody talks about is the effect it has on the sibling of the missing child. Right. Imagine growing up in a house where like this tragedy occurred and and having your entire childhood center around that event. Mm-hmm. You're no longer just you. Everybody that knows you or would meet you in the future ties you to that, you know, one event. You're right. that yeah. yeah. That one event or to your missing sibling. Mm-hmm. And it's just, it's just sad on right. many different levels. And maybe that that is what can explain in some small way why Stephen's older brother, Carrie Stainer, grew up to become a monster. Oh, oh man. According to an article on History.com, Carrie Stainer began working as a handyman at a motel near Yosemite National Park in, uh, in the West Coast state of California. Wow. On February 15, 1999, three tourists at the motel, 42-year-old Carol Sund, her 15-year-old daughter Julie, and their 16-year-old family friend Sylvina Peloso went missing. In March, the charred remains of Carol Sund and Sylvina Peloso were discovered in the trunk of their burned-out rental car in a remote area several hours from the motel. Julie Sund's decomposed body was discovered in March 20, uh, on March 25th in an isolated location less than an hour away from the rental car. Right. Oh, wow. Investigators hmm. initially interviewed Carrie Stainer in the case, but didn't believe, th- I mean, he was just too clean cut looking. Yeah. Uh, and he had no history of violence. So they they moved on to other, to focus on other The people. usual suspects, yeah. <laughs> well, then on July 22nd, later that year, uh, 1999, the decapitated body of Joy Armstrong a 26-year-old Yosemite naturalist was found near her cabin. So she she had, I mean, in spite of what happened to her, she had this amazing job where she right. had this little remote cabin within the park. It was awesome. Um, <laughs> <laughs> anyway, Stainer was detained and questioned by investigators who also searched his truck, but he was ultimately why was let he go. Picked, why was he chosen to be talked to? You know, I, I'm not entirely sure. I think maybe somebody... Put him in the area. Put him in the area. Okay. Um, he had a, I think he had a pretty distinctive truck. Um, but they, but they eventually let him go. Later, however, they wanted to question him further. Brought him into the station, and then he confessed. Wow. That he surprised them all by confessing to killing all four women. Oh my goodness. Mm. Uh, Stainer later stated that he had fantasized about killing women since he was a child, and during uh, the trial, his. Lawyers argued he suffered the effects of mental illness, childhood sexual abuse, and the trauma of his brother's kidnapping. Hmm. Stainer was convicted on all four murders and given the death penalty, but he is still alive. He's currently on death row because California has a weird relationship with the death penalty. Yeah, Yeah. it takes a long time there. Um, Hmm. Continuing the topic of crime in national parks, there is a curious loophole in the United States Constitution in which a person could theoretically avoid conviction for any major crime up to and including murder. Really? According to Wikipedia, the United States District Court for the District of Wyoming is currently the only U.S. District Court to have jurisdiction over parts of multiple states. Right. It's because its jurisdiction includes all of Yellowstone National Park, which extends beyond Wyoming's borders into uh, Idaho and Montana. Mm -hmm. So in addition, the federal government has exclusive jurisdiction over the park. So crimes committed in the park cannot be prosecuted under any of the state laws. It goes straight to federal federal laws. Yeah, Yeah, straight to federal. Stay with me here. 
<laughs> it's a lot of legal stuff. <laughs> Trials in the district court are normally held at the federal courthouse in Cheyenne, Wyoming. Right. However, the Sixth Amendment to the United States Constitution uh, states that a defendant in a federal criminal case has a right to a trial by a jury made up of citizens who are both from the district and the state where the crime was committed. I'm with you so far. Okay. okay. What's the What's the issue? So yeah. Because of all all of that, there exists in Yellowstone Park an uninhabited area of the park in Idaho, not in Wyoming, okay. in Idaho, where Cross there's the no people to make up a jury. <laughs> <laughs> so you would so, have to actually take someone out there to commit the crime. Right. And you're, you're good. You're yeah. scot-free. So don't don't go hiking with anybody. <laughs> <laughs> hey, let's the, go over there. No, I think I'll stay on this Theoretically, side <laughs> you could commit a crime, even murder, and not be able to be tried for it in court according to how the Constitution is written. No. This area has become known as... Dun, 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 the zone of death. Ooh. <laughs> that that right there can only happen here. <laughs> the zone of death, a place where you could get away with murder, or could you? Or could okay. you? I'm, I'm could guessing you? there would be a somebody would find a way around. Where's it. the loophole? Well, here's the thing. There's been at least one attempt at fixing the loophole because because there was a guy that that found this, that figured yeah, yeah. this out. He was a writer. And there's a lot of writers that have taken advantage of this and right. and, and, and end of yeah. plots and everything. Mm -hmm. But um, there was a one crime of poaching. I think it was an elk that was committed mm -hmm. in the zone of death. Right. And the defendant attempted to use the loophole, but the court dismissed the argument and the defendant took a plea deal. Oh. So in the case of a major crime, I'm quite sure yeah. that the loophole would be addressed yeah. and like, changes oh, would be made. Oh, that's cute. We know yeah. you right. killed him. Yeah. Right. Too bad. <laughs> so sad. We'll figure this out. Anyway, I got my info. that from... or you're in prison to stay in that zone for the rest of your right. life. <laughs> <laughs> you get an ankle monitor. You can only sit right there. You're stuck you in the zone. Of... You step out yeah. of that zone, you're ours. I got my <laughs> info from Wikipedia. <laughs> All right. Well, let me tell you about another one, another park that I've been to. This is called Shiloh National Military Park. Uh, really interesting place. It's located in southern Tennessee. It spills over into northern Mississippi. Uh, it's not near any major thoroughfares, and thus is little visited. But I have to say it's one of the most memorable national parks that I have ever toured. Uh, my wife and I stopped at Shiloh one June day on our way home from visiting Nashville. Less than half a dozen cars were in the parking lot, and we both enjoyed and were a bit amused by an informa uh, informative video shown in the visitor center, which had been created sometime in the 1950s, literally, <laughs> And it had all the hallmarks of the 16 millimeter educational movies that I watched when I was in elementary school. I remember those. I remember those. I had read about the Battle of Shiloh before we traveled there. Uh, the great Civil War historian Shelby Foote declared Shiloh to be his favorite place to explore. The setting is beautiful, as gently rolling hills covered with massive oaks and pines sprawl along the Tennessee River. Early in the Civil War, April 1862, to be exact, the Union General Henry Halleck noted the importance of the town of Corinth, Mississippi. This small town near the Tennessee border was the junction where the Memphis to Charleston Railroad crossed the Mobile to Ohio line. Halleck uh, correctly believed that he, uh, if he could control this rail juncture, he could cripple the Confederate ability to transport men and supplies throughout the South. Thus, he and some 60,000 troops moved southward toward Corinth. The Union Army camped at a place along the Tennessee River called Pittsburgh Landing and waited for more reinforcements to arrive. General P.G.T. Beauregard of the Confederate <laughs> Army. I'm sorry, Beauregard. that is, that is such course. a Confederate name, <laughs> Beauregard. He also knew the importance of Corinth as he had some 65,000 troops entrenched around the city. Hearing of Halleck's Union troops moving his way, Beauregard sent General Albert Sidney Johnson with 40,000 men to move forward and try to surprise the Union Army by attacking them near Pittsburgh Landing at a location called Shiloh Church, some 20 miles north of Corinth. Early in the morning of April 6, 1862, the Confederate Army surprised the Union Army while they were still cooking breakfast. <laughs> and began attacking. During the day, the battle raged through forest and over farmers' fields. The fighting was often at close contact and was savage. Ugh. By the end of the day, the Union Army had been pushed all the way back to the riverbank. But overnight, Union reinforcements arrived by boat coming down the Tennessee River. Thus reinforced, on the following day, April 7th, 
the Union regained the ground they had lost the previous day. By the end of the second day, the Confederates began to retreat toward Corinth. The toll of the two-day battle was staggering, as a total of some 3,600 were dead, mm. nearly 17,000 wounded, with more, uh, and many of whom would ultimately su succumb to their wounds, and around 4,000 were missing. The casualties were nearly evenly divided between the two sides. According to an article in the National Park Service .gov, NPS .gov, the number of dead and wounded in this two-day battle was more than what the U.S. suffered during the entire Revolutionary War, the War of 1812, and the Mexican-American War combined. Oh, my goodness. We've talked before at how yeah. how much, how many casualties right. in the Civil War. The Civil was. War, this, just in two days. These figures shocked the nation, and they also became a foretaste of many more deaths and casualties to come. Yep. One place in the park that's interesting is called Bloody Pond. Soldiers from both sides attempted to clean their wounds in this pond, which soon turned bright or red in color. It's rumored that the pond will still turn red from time to time, though it was green when we uh, went there. Another place to visit are the two cemeteries. The Union dead, who could be identified, were buried with full military honors and have tombstones bearing their names, ranks, and their regiment. The Confederate dead were buried in mass graves. Of course, the tremendous carnage has led many to claim that they see the ghosts of soldiers wafting about the battlefield from time to time. There's no shortage of supposed video sightings posted on social media. A website called the scared I'm sorry, the scarechamber.com <laughs> states that visitors have reported hearing voices, footsteps, and even gunshots, as though the dead soldiers continue to wage war trapped in space and time. Another oddity of, the, of Shiloh is that within the park are the remains of a much older settlement. The Shiloh Indian Mounds are six rectangular mounds that serve as platforms for Native American towns' important buildings. A town that existed before Shiloh, before the Civil War, or even perhaps before Columbus. The buildings are believed, were believed, to, are believed to have been a council house, religious building, and homes for the most significant leaders. So in the middle of the Civil War site, you have an ancient Native American site uh, that uh, that's kind of right in the, right in the middle of the spot. Uh, to me, the most memorable part of Shiloh was walking through the battlefields. And like I say, you, there's nobody visits there hardly. So there's maybe two or three other cars that were driving around the park when we were there. Mm -hmm. So you really have it to yourself, and you know you can read descriptions about where the battles took place. And so walking through those battlefields and then the cemeteries. And then driving around the park, there's kind of a loop road that goes through the whole park, and there's a section that's really heavily wooded, and then it suddenly opens up onto the banks of the beautiful Tennessee River at Pittsburgh Landing, at this very stunning point where the Union troops arrive to reinforce their comrades and turn the tide of the battle. And oh yeah, by the end of May 1862, the Union had captured the important railroad junction at Corinth, Mississippi. So if if you have an opportunity to go to Shiloh, I highly recommend it. It's uh, really stunning, but it's very out of the way also. Uh, you know, I I watch all of these videos on uh, TikTok or whatever it is that uh, metal detecting. Right. I would love to go metal detecting. Yeah, I don't think they like let that. you go in the park, they but they don't. but you can go there. Are fringe areas around the park that you can go, and people find grape shot, and you know, there, there's I saw a little mm -hmm. store. On the edge that had some, you know, small shell, you know, fools for, uh, bullets for sale, and even a cannonball or two, you know. So wow, yeah, you'd have to get special permission. Yeah. So I we think. have some really diverse national parks, right? Yep. And we we didn't even we just tip scratched the, the surface, yeah. yeah. Right. Which I think there's a national park on an iceberg, isn't? No, well, maybe not. <laughs> huh? I think almost all of Alaska is a national Pretty park, much, isn't it? Pretty much, yeah. I'll fit a lot of federal land there, that's for sure. For sure. And now it's time, boys and girls, for the trivia challenge. <laughs> All right, time for the trivia challenge. You know how this works. Like and follow our Facebook page at Remnant Stew Podcast. Like and share this episode post. Put your answer to the trivia challenge question in the comments on that post. The first individual to do all that will be the winner and will be mentioned in an upcoming episode of Remnant Stew. Our trivia challenge is also open to school kids. If you're a teacher and your class listens to Remnant Stew, we challenge them to answer the trivia challenge. 
Send us the answer through email at staycurious at remnantstew.com. If your class is first to answer, we will send a care package to the whole class. That's what right. kind of a deal is that? Woohoo! So, what's the uh, trivia question today? Well, Harbin Gold sent this in. Uh, where is the smallest, quote, official, quote, unofficial <laughs> uh-huh. national park located that was created by a clerical error? Oh, oh really? Interesting. Yes, I had never heard of this before. That's yeah, interesting. very interesting. That is interesting. Hmm. Cool. Hey, thanks for spending some time with us. Check us out on Facebook and Instagram at Remnant Stew Podcast. You can also send us an email to say hi or suggest a topic for a future episode at staycuriousremnantstew.com. We'd love and want to hear from you. Remnant Stew is a part of Rook and Raven Ventures and is created by me, Leah Lamp. Dr. Stephen Meeker and I research, write, and host each episode along with cringy commentary by our audio producer, Philip Sinkfeld. Theme music is by Kevin McLeod with voiceover by Morgan Hughes. Special thanks goes out to Judy Meeker and Harbin Gould. Now, before you go, please hit the follow button so you won't miss an episode. Head on over to Apple Music and leave us a review. We love reading those reviews. Share Remnant Stew with your friends, your family, and your local park ranger. Until next time, remember to choose to be kind and And always always stay curious. curious.